Hello, welcome to the New York Parrot Literary Corner. I am your host and anchor, Dustin Pickering. Today, we have Rick Christensen, who is a refugee from corporate America. After retiring a few years ago, he returned to his first love of writing. His work can be found in the archives of Oddball Magazine online and on his Twitter feed. His poem, George's Bloom, has been selected for the upcoming Spring 2021 edition of Muddy River Poetry Review. He will be a featured poet for the Uncloistered Poetry Zoom event on 5921. He lives in the heart of darkness to be found in the Middle West with his Basset Hound Annie. His father always said to be sure you leave a hole when you were gone. He is filling that hole with words. So we're going to have you on today is filling the hole with words. Nice to meet you online. Uh, how are you today? I am great. Very nice to meet you too, Dustin. Uh, uh, I read some of your work recently and uh, we've got a friend in common, uh, Kushel Potter, uh, yes. who uh, said uh, that uh, you guys have had a lot of discussions about, uh, about uh, my degrees in philosophy and religious studies from many years ago. And uh, so uh, uh -huh. it, I, uh, I read your, your wonderful little, uh, your combination of uh, two poems and then uh, your exposition on Martin Heidegger's being and uh, in time. So uh, I'm excited to do this because that's a, an area that I'm interested in. Right, I did notice that in one of your descriptions on odd, an oddballs, your bio said you're interested in epistemology. I thought, and that factored into your work. That was actually one of the questions I wanted to talk about, but I'll get to that later. Okay. Uh, my, my, my first one is, tell us a little bit about your creative process and um, do you reach new insights when you're writing or reading your own writing? Well, I'm a lot of poets and I'm one of them. We tend to overwrite uh, initially. You know, you put something down on the page. You know, there's the old saying, uh, write drunk and uh, edit sober. And, <laughs> uh, and so uh, what I will do is I will get a lot of information down and then you go back into that editing process and of course that can be painful you know you've created this beautiful child and then you have to listen to it scream as you cut off its appendages mm. uh but uh so so that that really is my process i start out with just generally an idea and then i just throw a whole lot of words on a page and then as i start going through it it starts to take form and uh and you know sometimes an analogy I have used with friends is writing a poem is a lot like taking a St. Bernard for a walk. Uh, you know, you, you've got your hand on the leash and you know uh, the neighborhood and the route you want to take, but if you hang on, you could end up anywhere. And uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that happens with poems. And, yeah, uh, and it's happened with a lot of mine. So, uh, so really my process is you come in with an idea and then you focus on getting that idea across. And the key to poetry, of course, is you want to do it elegantly. You want to be evocative. You want to, to get in there. And I mean, if I want to say something with a lot of words, I'll write an essay. Uh, mm -hmm. A poem is to find the way to say it most closely and most elegantly and, and use the fewest number of words to say as much as you can. And that's what's fascinating to me about it. And uh, yeah, I hope that's a good answer. That is a good answer. I think a lot of people reading, you know, listening in can get a lot from the, uh, um, uh, you know, from that particular point of, of cutting the language a little thinner than trying to, you know, there's a lot of talk about not editing actually nowadays. And I think that's it's very valid to say, you know, I have a, a professor friend who tells me, you know, only thing I could ask you to do in your writing is not to be so in love with the language and the way I, because I string things sometimes, and sometimes it's it's like, yeah, that that can go. That's just fun for the word. It's not for the poem. It's for the word, the joy of writing the word. So, you know, going back into the uh, philosophy and epistemology, I'm wondering how does that factor into your poetry, and what is it you find intriguing about epistemology? Well, uh, of course, it's the study of language and poetry is, is a form of communication. And then within epistemology, a focal uh, area for me has been um, the uh, theories concerning perception, uh, something you've hit on in some of your writing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the delineation between the self and, and other. 
Uh, and what's fascinating to me about a poem, uh, I think it was C.A. Conrad who said, if you do it right, a poem uh, on the page is, if it's read by a thousand people, it's actually a thousand different poems because that relationship between the person who's written it and the person who's reading it, you know, you've got to let it go out there and that's to try to make distinctions between self and other. Uh, you know, you're familiar with like Leibniz and the idea of windowless monads and, and, you know, do we really, you know, what is perception? You know, do we actually directly perceive anything? Um, you know, what is the distinction between self and other? And so I sort of have that sort of informing whenever I write as much as I can. But of course, you know, then you get down to, hey, it's a poem about my reminded about how people approach their marketing and their and their and their their craft. I think that's good. Um, so would you like to uh, share a poem with us? Oh uh, sure. Uh, it's uh, it's poetry month, so yes, I will uh, I will start out with sort of an an o it's called love letter to a poet, and uh, and uh, yeah, this was published uh, in Oddball uh, in February, and uh, it's sort of I think it, it's a, it's it's a poem by a poet, but it's a but it's about you know the relationship we have with poets. So mm -hmm. love letter to a poet. I think my affections would still be intact if you were a notary. Your elegance and stealth would be apparent even on embossed documents. But your playful yet deft hand that so effortlessly untangles misshapen metaphors would be less obvious on a contract or deed. The poem is your vehicle in which you carry me to these unanticipated landscapes and sometimes destinations. You always make me feel better, except when you don't. You see that it is okay to color outside of the lines sometimes, but that it should always be on purpose. You do not seduce me, but I do seduce myself on your behalf. There is beautifully crafted work that I can enjoy for its structure and the clever way it intricately solves problems with deft shifts of word and line but it is sometimes sterile. Your poetry never is. Your words grow from a very rich, dark earth, more satisfying than simply grazing scholarship. You sing the savage, greedy song of mine before yours, and I tilt my head to listen, to find balance and tempo. I come to be tickled by phrases, but am instead changed. And so it is that each tapestry changes me to be ready for the next that will come. And so it is that I am new and renewed, ready for the morning sun. That's interesting. It's very excellent work there. I appreciate you reading that one. I was actually planning to ask some questions about that. Um, my first question about it is, uh, it's not to a specific poet. It's, what's the inspiration uh, and what was it a response to? Uh, Actually, I was uh, reading a, a wonderful book. Uh, it was uh, a finalist for the National Book Award by an incredible poet named Ilya Kaminsky uh, yes. called Deaf Nation. And uh, it was a combination of that and a very dear friend who uh, has been writing poetry for many years, but has only recently started to publish uh, Beverly. Uh, it was sort of to, to her because I've been helping her uh, kind of functioning as an ad hoc editor and, uh, and, and, you know, getting her into the process that I've been really in since 2016. I mean, it, I'm, I'm sort of a new and emerging poet, even though you can see by the beard, I'm, I'm not a new and emerging person. <laughs> uh, I, right. uh, I retired. Any age is uh, a good age. Yeah. I, I retired in 2016 and got back to writing for the first time in a long time. And, uh, and so I've been thinking about this, you know, from a process standpoint, poetry is so important and we've lost, uh, as, you know, 
Instagram and 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 uh, well, Twitter. What 146? I think they've doubled it now. Uh, the number of characters you can have, but how many people are reading anymore? And uh, and so that's what I want to try to communicate about the process. What is poetry? Why is it valuable? It's one of the reasons I was excited to participate in uh, in this program because that's what you guys are doing. You are trying to to help the artistic community reconnect with uh, with people and to get out there and talk about the process. And uh, and so that's what it's about. Right, and that's exactly what we're, we're hoping to continue doing for a while and bringing new people in. So if anybody's listening in and they wanna you know, join us on the program at some point, just feel free to look us up and email me or message me on Facebook. I'll try to do my best to answer. So my one of the lines that strikes me in that and that particular uh, piece was the playful yet deft hand, and so uh, it's it's a, it's it's a kind of a description of the way uh, poets play with language, you know, uh, deft. That that's such a powerful word to be using in that context. Um, so, what exactly? What exactly when you say deft? Do you have any idea what what you were trying to convey there? Well, I think that a fully realized poem, if you go back to the poet, they're going to be able to tell you that they believe that every word in that poem is necessary. Mm -hmm. Because as I was talking about earlier, you know, the, uh, the, the difficulty of, of editing, you take out the words that aren't necessary. You bring it down to an essential structure. So every word, every phrase, that word is there for a reason. It's in the place it is for a reason. And you're attempting to convey an idea, but what makes poetry special compared to essay or short story is you're trying to do it elegantly. You're trying to mm -hmm. do it, you know, it's almost like verbal Sudoku. Uh, yeah, you're, mm -hmm. you're, you're saying, how do I find just the right number of words in just the right order? And you keep going back to that and back to that. And, uh, and so that, that's really what I think it's about. It's, uh, there, there are people who say that poems are not, uh, they're storytelling, but they're, they're less about ideas and more about the actual words. And again, coming back to epistemology that we were talking about before, it's part of what fascinates me about it. It is a very, very specific way to communicate. And, uh, we, of course, have a lot of different forms and you can do rhyming and you've got form poems and, you, you know, more and more we've got free verse, but, uh, but it's, a, it's that interplay of, of the word with the idea and doing it elegantly. Right. Now, just a you know, basic question, um, you know, for viewers out there who are not familiar with what epistemology might be, uh, could you define it for us a little, maybe just a loose definition, it doesn't have to be very specific. Uh, it's it's essentially the the study of language itself. What is language? What is the the, the purpose of language? Uh, it goes back to uh, at least in Western philosophy, uh, Socrates and Plato, uh, the dialogues. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, it's saying how do I convey ideas in a way that is clear, in a way that you know, cannot be misinterpreted. And, and then of course, it very quickly rolls over into theories of perception. You know, what constitutes uh, having perceived? You know, things like the spectrum problem. The spectrum problem is essentially, is my blue the same as your blue? If right. I, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that's fascinating because we are all individuals and we don't really know what anyone else is doing or perceiving. And poetry, language, storytelling, they're all of these attempts to connect to people who are autonomous, who are windowless monads, if you will, sitting mm -hmm. within themselves and not knowing that the world that they see is, you know, they, the, the movie series, The Matrix, kind of got into a lot of that. I think that is part of what fascinated people because they had a lot of great special effects, but the essential idea was that perception is malleable. 
and 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 it is malleable and it that that malleability is manifested more than anything else in language and how language mm -hmm. is used and that's what epistemology studies and that's just fascinating to me because my entire life i've loved stories and uh and you know the the key to storytelling is words right so would you like to uh, read your basset helm poem for us sure i would be happy to let me pull that baby up here okay and again what i'm trying to convey here is literally an experience the experience that i have or anyone else has when they take her out she's 13 years old she's the love of my life uh, and she is a basset, which means uh, her entire brain is in her nose. And uh, mm -hmm. I call it lowrider. And I uh, and it is also an homage to uh, to the the song by War, because the rhythm that this dog has when she's out there and going through the neighborhood is a lot like that that song Lowrider by by War. So here we go, lowrider. She is a lowrider. Chassis almost touches the ground. Ears that sweep a path before her like Moses parts the sea. White tip tail telegraphs her trajectory. She weaves through sense without sense, nose to the ground, learning more from a blade of grass than the contents of a dictionary. She slips the bounds of her boundaries, brimming with a belly bouncing on the ground, hungry for the promise of the next trail, straining at the lead, force enough for dislocation, taking corners like an Indy car, hound enough for herself. She takes me into one more trail, both chests heaving, both tongues hanging, both butts dragging, chase without prey, rabid for the rabbit, hound enough for us both. She's a low rider, chassis now touching the ground, past the porch we pace, foam speckles the air, she shakes her folds for one more round, still straining at the lead, sniffing at phantom beasts, hound enough for us all, Hound enough for us all. Excellent. I, I like the way you read it too. It was very excited. So I felt like the pace, you know, as I was going with the walk, you know, it's like I felt kind of like I was actually there in a way. So I think you captured that moment quite well. And I think there, if you really want to get picky and as persnickety as you used the word you used earlier, um, then you could say there's a little bit of epistemology in that too when you talk about the dictionary and the, you know, more, more in the nose and, and in the blade of grass than, than all the words in the dictionary. So it's yeah, like, exactly. you know, mm -hmm. so you, you did a marvelous job of bringing all kinds of things into this one isolated experience. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. I do have one other I would love to read today because yes, it's, please Parrot, do. Par it's Parrot TV. And this one uh, uh, got published about four years ago. And, uh, and then I'll tell a story about it afterwards, but it is called why men should not own parrots. Mm. So I thought it might uh, work for today. So Absolutely. here we go. Why men should not own parrots. A big Amazon gray. That's what I'm not going to have. The blank feral countenance, almost too much to bear, like looking into a mirror. They live a long time. Such a commitment. My friend had one once. It went on a rampage repeatedly. Like a confused, angry child, it turned everything over and then did it again. Finally, exhausted, it sat confused, wondering why so much effort led to so little effect. The mood swings are the hardest part. A man needs stability and they bite. You must feed them every day and they will send scattered seed husks to the floor that may cause you to slip and fall if you are not careful. They are always hungry. I have read that you could leave on the television. The noise and light provide some stimulation while you are away. When you do arrive home, they become excited and they try to hide their emotions with Kung Fu kicks from the perch, waiting for you to make the first move toward reestablishing a relationship that has diminished in your, abs in, in your absence, even if only for the day. They are related to the dinosaurs and seem afraid of the same extinction. That is why they cling to your shoulder, waiting for you to whisper your secrets to them. They like repetition. It makes them feel secure. 
You must know what they need without being told, or they become waspish and aloof, or sometimes solicitous, like a child who smells the candy in your pockets. It is exhausting to be the object of such anticipation without direction. No wonder you delay your arrival longer each day. Perhaps a parakeet or a cockatiel, light enough to perch on your finger will suffice. Certainly one of those would be harder to notice when you are tired and do not wish to attend. Where there is less weight, there is less gravity and the tantrums are smaller. Interesting. I, I think there's a lot of, of uh, comedic effects there. It, was there a serious point you were making or was there a, was it intended to be kind of a joke? You're well, it, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a metaphor for relationships and, right. uh, and, and it certainly could be read as, uh, uh, as an indictment of, uh, uh, of the, the classic, uh, uh, classic family roles of one person being at home all the time and the other person, you know, coming into that and being tired and having that expectation. But, uh, you know, getting back to talking about how uh, a, a poem, once you put it out there, belongs to your reader. After I published this, I cannot tell you the number of people who came back to me and were like, oh, I have a parrot and you've described this so well. And they thought that it was, <laughs> you know, a literal uh, a description of my relationship with a parrot. And uh, I don't own a parrot, but I've been in relationships uh, that uh, that this does a pretty good job of describing from both sides. Interesting. I think that uh, how long ago did you put you said four years ago, right? Yeah, that I think this published. one came out uh, in like uh, uh, 2017 or 2018. Interesting. And so in your in your bio, you say you took a hiatus. Uh, was there any reason for that? Or was it just, you know, you had too much to do, too much going oh, on? Oh, I, I, my hiatus was 40 years. I mean, I, right. I, I, I wrote in college, uh, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I was uh, I was a credit executive uh, litigation uh, specialist with a department store uh, credit department. I had two kids. I had a wife. I had to paint, you know, mow the lawn, go on vacation, take my son fishing. And uh, I just didn't have for that period of time. And everybody makes different choices, but I didn't have the energy to focus. Well, I'm retired now. Right. And, uh, and perfect time for writing poetry. And now I'm not retired because I have a second career. I'm a oh. poet. I'm a writer. <laughs> right. There you go. No better time to write poetry than when you have plenty of space and energy and time and you're relaxed and you have thought, you know, your thought processes are really active and going, blah, 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 you know, your, your synapses are flowing crazy. You know, you have all these ideas flowing into you and out of you and you just have to, somewhere you have to put it, you know? So, so that's a, that's definitely a good time is when you're retired because then you're reflecting back on life and forward in life and all this is going on at once. So so that, that's, it's a good time, I think, for you. I guess look forward to more poetry in the future as well. So we have about uh, seven minutes or so left in the program. So if you want to, anything you want to add into the, uh, you know, as your final, final say comes on, you know, anything you want to tell poets of the future, writers of the future, creative minds, viewers out there listening in who are curious about the creative process. Okay. Well, uh, another reason uh, that having 40 years gone by has been very helpful is I, I think that every writer, whether they're novelists or poets or anything, they need to draw on their life experience. Uh, I mean, I've had people say, you know, who are your favorite poets? And, uh, and I, I have a number of them and, and I roll through them, you know, Mary Oliver, William Carlos Williams, uh, uh, you know, Wallace, uh, Wallace Stevens, of course, we lost Lawrence Ferlinghetti recently. Uh, right. there, there's so many different schools of poetry, so many different kinds of poetry. But what I think all of them have in common, uh, if they're good, is that they come from a, an essential place within that poet. poet. A poet has something to say about themselves or the world or a relationship they've been in or ideas that they have. And that's what you've got to do. Um, you know, I don't think poets should, should sit down and say, oh, I'm going to write a good poem because they never will. Mm -hmm. 
right. they have to say, I've got something that I need to say or want to say, let me find a way to do that. And then once they feel like they've made that first step, now let me go in and use some of my learning and some of the craft and some of you know the 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 ideas I've gotten from other poems or classes or you know just the, the history of, of literature and language and see if I can find a way to have what's on the page match what was in my mind, my soul, and my heart. You know, is it evocative? Uh, mm -hmm. Is it is it true, or you know, does it convey my truth? Um, I, I think a good storyteller understands that the same set of facts can tell a very very different story depending on where you stand, where the camera is, and who you're standing with. And uh, and so that's been essential for my process uh, is to just look at myself and the world and, 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 and what I'm doing in that context of position, again, like with epistemology. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got uh, two or three different uh, poems out there about this incredible pandemic year that we've had. Um, none have been published yet, but uh, hopefully, you know, we, all of us who do this, we, we know submittable and we know the journals and we know the juggling we do and we send it out mm -hmm. and if it gets rejected, re we rework it and send it out again. Uh, and I've been trying to, in those poems, convey what is happening to people and to me in the context of this plague year that we've had, the isolation, uh, the opportunities. Um, I've been involved more and more lately with, uh, with, with Zoom meeting poetry readings. It used mm -hmm. to be that when you wanted to read your poetry, you went down to the coffee shop, uh, you know, or the wine bar. I'm now in these Zoom meetings where I'm reading poems next to people from India and, you know, Portland, Oregon, and out here in St. Louis area where I am. You know, we're doing this right now. You're in Texas. Um, mm -hmm. And, and it, so there's, there's come with the, the wedding of technology and, uh, and necessity uh, because of the isolation, I, I think there's been sort of a renaissance in, uh, in I, I was joking with a friend, I said 10 years ago, if I had thought of myself as being a successful poet, uh, it might be because I got invited to my local branch library by the PTA to read you know, eight of my poems during National Poetry Month, that would, would be it. I'm now getting exposure to you know, nationally prominent poets. I'm becoming friends with some of these people. Uh, we're all sharing ideas. You're a nationally prominent poet. You have written some marvelous books. Uh, and, uh, and Thank you. Look at this opportunity to share ideas. Uh, so yes, it's been horrible this year, but everything has multiple sides. What perspective, we're going to have on it depends on where we choose to stand today. And so if I've got any message to a poet or a writer, it is first get clear on what the facts are and then get clear on where you are going to stand in relationship to those facts for this particular poem. poem. Because each one is unique, each one is a point of view and it's a way that we use words to hopefully create something beautiful. Well, thank you for your time on the show. It's been wonderful talking to you, Rick. And uh, please tell others about us. Uh, if you don't mind, just let people know we're looking for poets to interview, writers, creative minds. You know, the more creative you are, the better we, we love you. <laughs> just well, kidding. We love you. There's no, there's no scale. You know, it's just whatever yeah. you're doing, come and talk about it with us. We would love to have anybody on the program. You bet. And, and I encourage, uh, you know, you poets out there, you know, come, come to, these, to these Zoom meetings. I'm going to be uh, uh, one of the featured uh, readers uh, uh, at the Uncloistered Poetry uh, mm -hmm. uh, meeting in, next month. It's the second Sunday of every month. I'm uh, Wednesday Night Poetry, the longest consecutive running open mic, which is now being done online. They've got, I think, 1,800 weeks in a row. Um, mm -hmm. It's literally called... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Kai is wonderful. I just yeah, debuted is. on there a couple of weeks ago. 
you know, uh, Johnny uh, uh, McIntyre runs uh, runs uncloistered. Uh, I'm going to be uh, uh, tomorrow. We've got about on- less than a minute, so we got to close okay. the show. But it, you know, excellent talking with you. One million subscriber challenge. Subscribe to our station and click a like on on one of these videos. Thank you very much for joining us today. And we also love our viewers very much. We appreciate, you know, leave some comments for us. If you want something, you hear something, please do leave a comment. And we're also doing donations uh, currently. So if anybody would like to donate, just let us know and we'll make sure you can have the means to do that. Thank you for joining us today, Rick. Thank you very much. Take care.